Uncle Sam presents... Wings to Victory! Attention, Mr. and Mrs. Joe Smith, USA. The story of a sky battle over Guadalcanal and how Lieutenant Sam Houston saved the life of his squadron commander in one of the most daring aerial maneuvers possible in combat. Attention, Mr. and Mrs. Herb Johnson, USA. The story of a B-24 Liberator bomber and a thrilling raid on Axis battleships trying to intercept a huge convoy bound for the North African battlefront. From the West Coast, ladies and gentlemen, the Army Air Forces present Wings to Victory, a dramatization of American heroism based on official combat reports from the fighting fronts. For obvious military reasons, the names of places and characters in these true stories are fictitious. We open tonight's program with a special arrangement of Memories of 1917. Fighters and bombers are living up to the noblest traditions of American courage in daily combat with the enemy. But a brief time ago, the men in command of these planes were American boys named Tom, Dick, or Harry, no different from a host of youngsters who make up young America. The Army Air Forces selected these boys, trained them as pilots, navigators, bombardiers, and gunners. They are men now, worthy of any who have served and saved this nation in the past. To every young American between the ages of 18 to 26 inclusive, we say, go to your nearest Army recruiting station. If you are physically fit and mentally alert, perhaps you too may join the gallant flying columns who are leading the way to victory. If you command a squadron of fighter pilots on Guadalcanal, you've got to be a mixture of Hot Pilot Pete, Superman, Foxy Grandpa, and Aunt Nellie. It's the Aunt Nellie role that gets you down. On this particular morning, Captain John Westcott, commanding Fighter Squadron 71, has to be Aunt Nellie. Boy's life may depend on it. So Captain Westcott says a few swear words to himself, waits for a knock on the door of his office in the operations hut. He's sent for Lieutenant Sammy Houston, going to have a talk with this young man. It'll undoubtedly be embarrassing, probably won't do much good, but a squadron commander has his job to do. Lieutenant Houston reports as ordered, sir. Good morning, Sammy. Uh, how do you feel? Okay, sir. What's up? Oh, nothing. We're in reserve today, which means that we may get a rest until noon. Mm -hmm. I just uh, thought I should mention one or two things about your... Well, you're flying. Yes, sir. Now, look, Sammy, don't give me that deadpan take him. You know you've been off the beam lately. Have I, sir? In what way? 
But didn't you turn back and dive into a flock of about 30 zeros yesterday? Yes, sir. That was stupid, just plain stupid. Was it, sir? You know, doggone well it was. And here's another thing. The armament officer reports that you came back from the last four missions with empty gun belts. Did you shoot them all at Jap planes? No, sir. Ground strafing, weren't you? Yes, sir. That's pure and simple show-off stuff. Well, look, if you haven't any regard for your own life, you might at least think of your ship. We need every plane we've got on this island. Yes, sir. You're right, sir. You don't mean that. You think I'm Aunt Nellying you. Maybe you think I'm in my dotage. At 27, sir? Oh, hardly, sir. I hate to get tough about this, Sammy, but if you live long enough to be a squadron commander, you'll understand. The next time you take your ship into too many Japs or shoot up their trenches without orders or daisy cut those palm trees west of the field, I'm going to ship you back to Australia. Yes, sir. But they tell me that you used to be... I don't care what they tell you I did. I don't do it anymore. I'm responsible for you kids, and I'm going to keep as many of you alive as I can. Yes, sir. Is that all, sir? Yes, that's all. Got a cigarette, Jack? Yeah, here. Thanks. I, uh, I'll try to be more careful. Okay. Young Sammy Houston walks out of the operation set, shaking his head. He thinks of the pride of place, pomp of power, of what two silver bars will do to a nice, lovable chap like Squadron Commander Westcott. It's a soft, quiet morning on Guadalcanal. Marines and doughboys are keeping up their ceaseless duel with Jap snipers beyond Henderson Field. But such obnoxious characters as Whistling Charlie, Willie the Louse, and Mill Train Tojo are sulking somewhere in Jap country. And, for the time being, silent. Lieutenant Houston slaps absently at mosquitoes, walks toward a lean-to, which the squadron uses as a loafing place. The gin rummy games have started. Pilots in khaki shorts and sweat streak shirts are playing cards on the tops of gasoline drums. Hey, Sammy. Look, you should have played your ace. Sammy! Why? Why? You know why. One dollar and eighty cents you got of mine. I want to win it back. Not now, pal, not now. Don't give me that. You got my dough. I got to check some guns, Grimesy. But I'll be right back. Don't go away. The old man had told him to be careful. Lieutenant Houston feels very self-righteous as he trudges through a dripping palm grove toward his ship. He's told the sergeant to take those guns, but a careful pilot will make sure that it's been done. Lieutenant Houston flies a Curtis P-40 named Lulu, and Lulu has led a hard life. Her engine and her guns have had practically no rest for days. Quite a gal, this Lulu. Her long snout and painted toothy grin become visible through the camouflage of her dispersal point. Uh, good morning, sir. Good morning, Sergeant. How's it coming? Well, I've done about all I can, sir. She really needs some new guns. Her belt tracks are worn bad, and there's quite a lot of breech wear, too. Well, she hasn't jammed on me. Take a good look for yourself. Okay. Don't wear now, Lulu. You see, right, right along here, I've put in new belts, and they'll probably feed all right, but you might get a split cartridge case any time. Uh, sure enough. Lulu, you're a problem child. Uh, she ain't pretty, but she's tough. Oh, don't say that, Sarge. You'll hurt her feelings. She's fundamentally beautiful. Her teeth are dirty and her complexion is sort of pimply, but I love her. Don't I, Lulu? I still say toughness is her main merit, sir. You've got no eye for real beauty, Sarge. Jap planes! Rambo! Rambo! All planes! All planes! Roll them out! All planes! That means us, Lulu. Break away the netting, Sarge! Here's your shoot, Lieutenant! I'm right behind you, sir. Good. Form on me as usual. 5,000 feet. We've got about 10 minutes. Let's go. Lieutenant Houston yanks Lulu upstairs. He hears Captain Westcott talking on the radio phone to the commander of Marine Squadron. What does the Navy say about it, Bill? It's a big show, Jack. 50 or 60 bombers and about 70 fighters. Coming down the same old groove. In three layers, 18 to 27,000 feet. 70 fighters? That's not so bad. Oh, we've had it worse. Well, I turned north here. Watch yourself. Thanks, Bill. 
Good hunting. Attention, 71. We're going into those clouds and lay for the bombers. It's our job to bust them up. Maintain radio silence from now on. Captain Wesker. Yes? May I ask Pete just one question? Go ahead, Joe. What did you do with the gin rummy cards, Pete? I hit them, pal. Where? In a good, safe place? Yeah, right here, under the seat. You goofed. They're the only pack of cards on the island. Take it easy, Joe. We'll stop a Mitsubishi and borrow a fresh pack. That'll do. No more talking. Yes, sir, Captain. Captain Westcott leads his squadron into a wilderness of broken white clouds. In close formation, they dodge erratically, stalking the Jap bombers along their expected course. Lieutenant Houston flies number three in the leading element. He really means to be on good behavior today. The old man wasn't fooling. Sammy and Lulu fight a good, sound, orthodox battle. Squadron 71 turns the corner of a sky mountain and then... The old man waggles his wings. He starts downward in a steep dive. Lieutenant Houston and Lulu follow him. The boy watching for that first glimpse of the enemy. There they are, Japs, lots of Japs. Big, fat Jap bombers swimming across the green length of sky and ocean. Divide it up, four at the tail, four at each flank. Get the gunners, get the gunners. Right behind you, Skipper, and I'm being careful. Okay, Lulu, now be a good girl. B-40s fall upon the Jap formation like winged sharks darting in, gnawing with hot lead. Skittering away to turn and attack again. Smoke starts streaming from one Jap. Hit bits of debris fly from another. A third bursts into flame and falls. Fourth dips crazily out of line. And then... Look out, Skipper! Zeroes! Zeroes! All right, boys. Let them come. Remember what I told you, Sammy? Yes, sir. Boy turns Lulu's nose into the blue. The zeros come monkey-shining across the sky, upside down, barrel-rolling, looping, madly clownish, without rhyme or reason. But Lieutenant Houston has fought them before. He brings Lulu almost to a stall, waits for a zero to flash across his sights. He doesn't have long to wait. Oh, baby, did that kite fall apart. Now, now we'll just duck down, Lulu, and... Hey, what's the trouble? Damn, my guns are jammed. Where's that clearing handle? Look, Lulu, you can't do this to me. Woo! <laughs> Close. Handle stuck. Can't clear my guns. Can't shoot. I better get out of this. We may have done some nutty stunts, Lulu, but we don't stick around Japs with dead guns. Come on, Lulu, we run. But as Sammy turns to work his way out of the dogfight, he sees Captain Westcott's plane flash by. There's a zero on Westcott's tail. Jack! Jack! Zero on your tail? Look out, Jack! Yeah, I know. I can't shake the little baboon off. I'll get him, Jack. Took a slant out of his eyes. The boy tugs desperately at his gun clearance lever. It's stuck fast. The zero chasing Captain Westcott opens fire. Tracer bullets whiz in vicious arcs around his ship. Captain Westcott turns and twists. He used every trick. But the Jap is good, too. Bullets strike Westcott's ship. Quickly, Lieutenant Houston makes a decision. I'll get him for you, Jack. I said I would. Come on, Lulu. We're going to rab that baboon and slice him in half. Puts Lulu into a power dive. He drops at 340, 400, 450. Then he banks. He throws up a wing. There's a crash. He goes staggering off toward the ocean. A hunk of Lulu's right wing tip has been torn off. But the Jap, where is he? The Jap's flimsy kite has been sliced in two. The forward half of the Zero drops like a stone. Its tail comes tumbling after. And Squadron Commander Westcott roars away to rejoin the battle. While Lieutenant Houston and Lulu... Oh, now, Lulu, behave yourself. You can fly with half a wing. Sure you can. See? Ah, girl. Now you're okay, Lulu. We're going right straight home. Well, why, my gosh. I believe we are. Well, I'll be doggone. Lulu, you are one tough little tramp. Gangway down there. I'm coming home, and I'm bringing Lulu. <laughs> Lieutenant Houston reports as ordered, sir. I'm uh, glad to see you, Sammy. I'm glad to see you, sir. Thanks. I'm uh, recommending that you be awarded the Distinguished Service Cross. I shouldn't do that. I don't deserve... You deserve it. 
In view of the fact that you saved my life, I suppose that I should overlook my warning. Well, I can't do that. You're grounded for one week for reckless flying. Yes, sir. Is that all? That's all. Uh, have a cigarette, Sammy? Thanks, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> Now, a bombardier flying in a B-24 Liberator has problems of his own. He must be a scientist of the clouds. You know, the crew of a Liberator, nicknamed she Doed it are still talking about their bombardier, Captain Phil Langan, and that raid on Mussolini's Navy in the Mediterranean. Captain Langan, a science major from Texas A&M and a Ph.D. to boot, should have been assigned to a ship named the Spirit of Euclid instead of she Doed it in the great battle of North Africa, Captain Langan had little desire to be a hero, and certainly no intention whatever of getting himself talked about. It all started one evening at a new American bomber base in Egypt. Corporal. Corporal. Yes, Captain Langan. Where's Major DeKalb? I think he's still talking to those British officers in his tent, sir. That's right, Prof. There's a big powwow on. Oh, good evening, Benny. Uh, never mind, Corporal. Yes, sir. What do you suppose is cooking, Prof? I've just got a presentiment that Major DeKalb and Colonel Albertson are planning a raid. Tonight? Why, we just moved in here yesterday. It'd be typical of them. And I need orientation. The wind is different in this part of the world. The lights and shadows are tricky. If we should operate over the sea, there'll be a distortion of image which will... Oh, now, Prof. What bomb sight you can't miss? It's like shooting fish in a barrel. Optically a fine sight, yes. But do you realize that a reflex lag, one hundredth of a second in the bombardier, could throw an error of 26.89 feet at 20,000 altitude? No. I've been timing my reflexes. They're definitely slower here than in England. Huh. Let me show you my chart. Captain Langan's presentiment of a raid is correct, even if his reflexes have slowed. Great affairs are moving beyond the confines of this desert airfield. In far off Gibraltar... Code for Cairo and Alexandria. Duplicate to Chief Otnav and Chief RAF. Immediate. Yes, sir. Immediate. British Naval Headquarters at Alexandria receives the message. An officer hurries in to the Admiral. Two convoys, 96 ships, cleared Gibraltar at 19.00 hours. Request air reconnaissance and escort to pick them up at coordinate B6. Very well. Get me Air Marshal Ridpoff on the telephone. Royal Air Force Headquarters is already humming with activity. Regular patrol planes from Alexandria and Malta have spotted a powerful task force of the Italian fleet putting to sea from Pantheria. Air Marshal Ridpath is checking his available bomber squadron when the Admiral calls him. Ridpath speaking. Tony, this is George. Have you received the message from Gibraltar? Yes. The Italians are on to us. The devil, you say. They're coming out? Yes. Two battleships, a heavy cruiser, and several destroyers. What can you do? Not very much. We can't get to them in time to head them off. It's up to you, Tony. Well, the army's grabbed everything of ours to whack Rommel. But we'll do our best, George. Right, oh, good luck. Thanks. Oh, I'll ring you later and tell you what we've sent. I say, Forbes. Yes, sir. Uh, give that new Yank bomber squadron a buzz, will you? We're caught short, and, well, maybe they can help lend a hand. They're scarcely settled, sir. Well, that doesn't mean anything to the Americans. I wager they can be in the air in an hour. Buzz them like a good chap. And exactly 60 minutes later, nine B 24s lift from the desert airfield. <laughs> Convoys loaded with ships, troops, an enemy task force steaming to intercept them. But what is all this to bombardier Captain Phil Langan? For Captain Langan, war is algebra, war is trigonometry, war is a target caught in the ground glass and hairlines of a scientific miracle called the Norden bombsite. Captain Langan sprawls in the nose of the big deadly bomber and looks down at 400 square miles of the Mediterranean. Hey, Prof. Prof. Yes, Benny. Major DeCobb just called me on the radio phone. We're about 80 miles from the enemy task force. He wants you to pick the level of attack for the squadron. And we're to be the first plane to smack him. What level shall I give him? Tell Major DeCobb I think we should reserve judgment until the target is actually sighted. If I were to express it algebraically, I'd say that... Never mind, Prof. The Major just wants plain English. I'll tell him. Plain English. There's nothing plainer than a mathematical equation. Hey, Prof. Just a moment, Benny. Now, what is it? Major says, hurry up. He's got to report our bombing level to the British. They're going to send some torpedo planes in. Fighters from Malta, too. Fighters? Oh, Lord, do I always have to contend with fighters? They'll be spitfires, Prof. They'll help us fight off those Machias and Smitties. They're a nuisance. They set up a turbulence and a lateral wash. 
Couldn't Major DeKalb ask the British to keep those Spitfires away? I'll find out. Spitfires, wild hooligans. They think nothing of diving past a man's wing just as he's leveled on a target. Hey, Prof. Yes? The old man says he's very sorry, but he can't hurt the Britisher's feelings. And he still wants to know at what level you think it's best to bomb. I shall tell him at the earliest possible moment. This is no time for snap judgment. Okay, Professor. The Liberator bomber, nicknamed She Did It, sweeps on toward the Italian warships. Eight of her sister planes are with her. If those enemy battle wagons down there reach the lightly protected convoys, even Mussolini's discouraged sailors could cause terrible damage. Il Duce, a sword, scored all of his naval triumphs against lightly armed merchant ships. Now he might have 96 of them to shoot at. There is anxiety on the bridge of the convoy leader. Just got this flash from Spark, sir. Very well, thank you. Quartermaster, turn two points to starboard. Two points it is, sir. Hmm. Mr. Johnson? Yes, sir. Some WAP battleships are trying to head us off. Mulder reports them on this course here. Only two hours steaming from us, sir. Yeah, that's right. Are we getting any help? Well, they sent out some of our heavy bombers and a few British torpedo planes. It might be enough if they catch them in time, and if they hit them. I'm afraid that's a big if, sir. Yeah. Mr. Johnson? I think we'd better give the convoy the attack warning. Have all ships acknowledge and be ready to scatter. Aye, aye, sir. There is anxiety at naval headquarters in Alexandria, too. The Admiral eyes a clock on his office wall. He mops sweat from his face. The plane should have found them now by Stimson. I'll check with the RAF, sir. I hope I made it plain enough. We need those convoys. We've got to get them through. Liberator's bomb station, Captain Langan, gets a report from a British reconnaissance plane. Its pilot has found the enemy task force and has flashed radio bearings. Langan looks up from his calculations and clicks his interphone. Penny. Yeah, Prop. Kindly tell the Major I suggest we approach on course 17830 True at an altitude of 20,000 feet. My gosh, at last. Okay, Prop. Bombardier Langan removes his oxygen mask and wipes his glasses. He calmly puts the glasses back on his nose and the mask back on his face. He then uncovers the Norton bomb site, flicks the dust away expertly with a clean cloth. On his knees now, he glances through the plexiglass window of his greenhouse as the B-24 Liberator tears along at 300 miles an hour. There they are, Prof. We've caught them. See them, Prof? See them? Yes. Two big ones and a cruiser. And four, five, six destroyers. Yes, I see them, Benny. Tell the Major that I suggest we slow down to an airspeed of 225. Oh, they see us. They're shooting. Here come their fighters, spitties. Dozens of them. Gunners, all gunners. Wipe your eyes. Wipe your eyes. Prof. Prof. Yes, Benny. You okay? Why shouldn't I be okay? I thought maybe that last Did bird... Major DeKalb accept my suggestion? Yeah. I'm down to speed now, but... Led by she it, the B-24s rumbled toward the Italian fleet. The enemy battleships, cruiser and destroyer, hurl shells at the Yank bombers. German fighters swarm around them like angry sparrowhawks attacking eagles. she it is hit repeatedly. She fires back from every turret. But all this is mere sound and fury to the man who crouches in her greenhouse, his eyes waiting for a battleship to appear in the small square lens of his bomb site. Come on, Prof. Drop those bombs. Have a little patience, Benny. I've got her in the sight now. Hold her on course and level. She is on course and level, but she won't be long. What was that? Are you checking the controls, Benny? No, they got our number three engine prop. Straighten her up a little. No, 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 no. A little more right wing. There. There. Oh, this is a splendid target. Now, if you could just follow her a minute longer. No, they're hitting us, I tell you. <coughs> oh, they've thrown me offline again. Benny, Benny. Prop, another engine just smoked up. Hold her steady. Are the Bombay doors open? They've been open for hours. Ah, uh, now, just 16 <coughs> seconds more, Benny. We don't get a battleship every day, you know. I want all six bombs to... There! Bombs away! Six 500-pound bombs spill from she to its belly. Down, down, turned by speed, trajectory, and fall, they flash in the sun. They scream down upon that battleship. 
flame and steel spurt upward from the battle wagon's deck and superstructure. A stack collapses. A turret is wrenched aside as if by a mighty hand. The bridge goes up. Six hits. Six perfect hits. The battleship is done for. She stops dead in the water. And then, in waves of three, the other liberators blanket the rest of the Italian task force. Ah, Il Duchy, you should be here. The second battleship is a smoking torch. The cruiser breaks, plunges to her grave. Destroyers bob helplessly in the typhoon of TNT and hot steel. Oh, Il Duchy, why aren't you here? In she do its greenhouse, Captain Langan wipes his spectacles and looks down thoughtfully at the receding plumes of smoke. Captain Langan? Yes, Benny? Major DeCobb has just radio phoned you his congratulations. You got six direct hits, and the other boys did the rest. There ain't no more Italian Navy. Oh, boy, oh, boy, did we plaster them. Moratori te salutamus. Huh? What was that, Prof? Oh, I just feel a little wistful, Benny. There's a balcony on the Palazzo Venezia in Rome. It would be a beautiful target. Men speak of Warhawk fighters and Liberator bombing planes, of battles fought about far off places like Guadalcanal and Kiska, Bizert and Kunming. They speak in astonishment and pride and awe, as if it were by some miracle our air power had flung itself across alien skies to strike the foe. But these are not far off places. They're not alien skies. To American flyers, no spot upon the globe is strange. No starry bivouac is new. No trackless path under the sun is foreign. The sky is their own republic. It was discovered through the genius of the Wrights, explored by the pioneer vision of Curtis, Martin, Boeing, Douglas, and a host of other aerial frontiersmen. Billy Mitchell was their prophet, and bold captains like Rickenbacker and Doolittle led them on silver wings across continents and oceans until the world became a shrunken ball of dirt and water. They scoffed at time and laughed at distance. They flew on until they had carried their white star, their flag, and their dream into that new republic of the clouds. Their dream? Yes, a splendid vision of chasms bridged between nations, a peaceful commerce, an ordered liberty, and human brotherhood. But now, that ideal is challenged. The German brigand... The Jap pirate, the Italian scavenger, are fighting American airmen in their own vast domain. They fight on the stern frontiers of God's high heaven, where only the brave may enter, and only the free men shall stay. It's eagle country. Buzzards cannot endure its sunlight or prevail against its defenders. Look upward. The buzzards are falling with broken wings and bloody eyes. <laughs> Sergeant Hal Gibney speaking. This program came to you from the West Coast. This is the Blue Network.